the chairman of our company is a, a gentleman named Jim Clark, uh, who started, you know, a Stanford professor who started uh, first a company called Silicon Graphics and then went on to found Netscape. And people think or remember Netscape uh, mostly for the browser, um, you know, democratizing the internet, opening it up for everybody as the initial browser. But what was really interesting is they understood if you want to democratize stuff, that's the first step. But if you want to be able to do commerce on it, you got to be able to know that you're talking to the right things. So they invented SSL. Um, the modern day TLS, it's obviously gone through some changes since then. So we, sh we share some heritage uh, there, there you know, with, uh, uh, with the organizations you know, working that. So we've used a lot of those core techniques to build a modern phishing resistant uh, and passwordless uh, MFA, which we'll talk about. Um, don't let the zero trust thing get in, in your way. If, if that's, you know, you get people have a love hate relationship thing, but I'm gonna try to knit together um, some of the things that you need to think about. Uh, I'll, I'll let this go. I, you know, I said, you know, I'm, I'm a old engineer, meaning I've got a lot of gray hair and spent some time in the industry analyst. And then uh, my engineering friends told me I got a lobotomy and then went over to the marketing side. But uh, so I spent the last bunch of years in cybersecurity uh, over on the marketing side. Um, and it's been a fun ride. I, I really never thought I'd have a career uh, out of that, but it's, uh, it's certainly entertaining. As, as I like to tell new people coming into the field, it's kind of the, the gift that keeps on giving. There are no silver bullets. There are no magic wands we can wave, and it's going to continue to be complex. So we'll have to continue you know, to fight the good fight for a while. Um, how many, before I jump in, you can kind of see you know, what we're going to go through the day. By, you know, we're, we're near lunch, so you guys can just shout it out. What's the single largest attack vector? that the bad guys use to get in. Anybody? This, this number one. People? Identity, credentials. So all those are right, right? We attack the person. We attack the person's identity. And you know, far and away, uh, for all the you know, different classes of attacks, we'll get you some data on this in a second. No, it's, it's we're attacking the identity. Anybody know what the second, the second is? No guesses? The endpoint. So, if we're going to do, you know, if, if we're going to do what we need to do to better protect, we've got to pay a lot of attention to both of those things. So, um, I hope to make, you know, by the end of this, you know, a, a good case for why it is, you know, th this idea of zero trust really is about protecting both of those things. So, if we, a lot of times, if we're attacking the identity of people, we're using it, we're using, you know, a combination uh, of things. So, you know, phishing lures to, you know, attract somebody to click on them, et cetera. So, the first thing that we have in terms of our defense and depth strategy for that typically is all kinds of ways to filter out phishing links. And, you know, if you're getting a certain number of emails a day, you know, you're filtering out some, even a fairly high percentage of that, but you're not getting everything. So it's a probabilistic thing. We're, we're gambling a little bit that uh, a bad link uh, won't get through. And now it's gotten a little bit more interesting you know, as we both scale that up and we think about uh, not just email as a delivery system for that, we've got SMS, we've got all of our social platforms. So there's lots of different ways that we can. So the, the, the real bottom line to this is it's a, you know, more than a zero chance probability that some of those links are going to get through. We know that because we still get, we, you know, we're still getting hit with that kind of stuff. So great. Um, that, you know, and that doesn't say we shouldn't do this. We absolutely should. It's, you know, part of a, a kind of a defense in depth strategy. Um, but if that link gets through and I go to click the link, um, you know, maybe I'm smart and I don't. And, and this is literally for, for many of you, we train our users too, right? We train them to identify these things better. This is, you know, this is self-admission. This is a from a no before test testing that we do. So we train our, our, our workforce, just like many of you guys do, uh, send them links and, and give them training and hope that they won't click on them. Um, so we're, we're still at a probabilistic thing. It's, it's a not zero chance that they're gonna end up clicking on the link. Um, I've spent 25 years in cybersecurity and I think I've gotten nailed twice. Um, None, none at, at uh, Beyond Identity, interestingly enough, but at, at, at my prior employer, uh, I got nailed twice there. I got a, a Wells Fargo phishing email when I had just closed a Wells Fargo account at just kind of the right timing. Uh, so I waltzed right on into the CIO's office and you know, begged for forgiveness and, and everything. It, it, you know, caused no harm because it was a, just a training email, but I was pretty embarrassed uh, about the whole thing. So that's kind of where we sit. But if it's an off transaction, you know, what do we do? If, well, wait a minute, let's make it a little bit harder um, you know, well, let me, I'll, I'll sort of hit those stats. So um, 80, according to this year's Verizon data breach report, and if you look at it over the last 10 years, it's pretty steady in the 70 to 80 percent. You know, 70 percent of the initial attack vector uh, for web app breaches is, in, in this case, it's, uh, it was 86 percent this year, are credential theft, you know, and reusing credentials, however they get them. So that's, that's one way. By the way, I love to make fun of the strong password. We all should have different passwords and password managers to, you know, use different ones. So if we get, you know, it's stolen on one machine, we'll, we'll do it another. But a, a strong password, you know, they don't steal them. 
they're not cracking passwords these days. They steal them when they're open and they're clear. So do you think a piece of malware cares if it's four characters or 4,000 you know, 4, characters? It's not like weighing it and saying, well, this, this password's a little bit heavy. You know, maybe I won't send it, you know, send it back. Of course not. You know, it, it's more than happy to steal it. The second side of here is a ransomware uh, attack vector. I lost a bet to this on, our, on my CEO. I had to buy him dinner because um, he's, you know, I, I, was under, I was in the camp that said, listen, the number one attack vector starting point for ransomware attacks was actually um, malware deployed to the machine and then it you know, expanded from there. And it's not. It's, uh, you know, initial access brokers giving somebody access to a machine, you know, through, through credential theft or MFA bypass attack uh, and then you know, logging in and deploying, uh, deploying the ransomware. That's you know how it happens most of the time. That's ripped right from the, um, the Verizon data breach report, so you guys can check that out. Okay, great. So credential theft, what did we do to try to protect against that? We tried to make that a stronger thing, so we went to multi-factor authentication, right? We did you know things like you know TOTP, you know, one-time passwords, uh, or we did push notifications, or now more recently number match and things like that. Unfortunately, and, and I'll, I'll tell you what changed. Unfortunately, you know if you if you roll the clock back five, six, seven years pretty effective. It, it really did weed out a lot of stuff and the degree of difficulty of those kinds of attacks was pretty high. So they weren't in the, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily, you know, state-sponsored Russian actors that, that had to do it, but, you know, you had to be, you know, you had to be on your game technically to be able to pull that off. That's not the case anymore. So we've got a couple of different things that happen. The answer is that we've got a, a non-zero chance of blocking the, the phishing stuff, a non-zero chance of our end users clicking on something, and then a non-zero chance of traditional or legacy MF, MFA uh, stopping the effect of that click. Um, and there's, you know, real consequences. I, for a long time, it was interesting, for the last couple of years, you know, as we've been kind of felt you know, a little bit like we were waving the flag or, you know, um, you know, fighting with City Hall a little bit, I had lots of pushback from CISO buddies and, and folks when we were out there talking, it's like, oh, no, Google said it blocks 99.9% or Microsoft says, you know, what a difference a day makes. Those, those, that's not exactly what happened. So, you know, I'm not a blame, you know, shame and blame. These are guys have gotten caught up in it. Obviously, Octa's got the whole octopus campaign going on uh, with them. And, you know, most recently, you know, MGM, again, Initial attack vector, you know, it was an MFA bypass attack. Um, so, that all sounds terrible, right? You know, what are we going to do about it? Here's how they happen. You know, there's like really two classes of attacks with the MFA. You know, one of them is just pure social engineering, engineering attacks. It takes zero technical skill to do this. Just somebody who's got some, you know, pretty, you know, interesting and clever ideas about how to, you know, make a level of urgency in some sort of a message uh, or in some sort of a phone call. So, you know, it, a lot of pretexting kinds of things like get you to give me, you know, your password and your one-time code, calling the help desk, that sort of thing, uh, calling as if I'm the help desk. Um, on the other side of that, you've got push fatigue. You know, I'll, I'll keep trying to log in to a site if I've got, you know, user ID, you know, password installing, and you'll get that prompt. And, you know, after a while, you know, a non-zero number of folks will say, well, the hell with it, just, you know, whatever. You know, one of my employees is probably trying to get in, and, and that's, you know, that's led to some breaches. But the real change is, is the idea that there's a bunch of free and open source toolkits out there. This is Evil Jinx. This is one. There's a GitHub address at the bottom of that. You know, this isn't like I'm selling it on the dark underground. You know, they're advertising it on an open source uh, repo. So. Uh, with my outdated um, engineering skills, you know, I can fire up an AWS instance, you know, model my way through some, some Linux, you know, scripts and things like that to get it set up and do this and be up and running in a, in a half an hour. And if any of you had, you know, on your bingo cards, I know we've hit it a little bit, you know, in the last couple of days, AI, make sure we check that off. We, we were playing around a little bit with ChatGPT. Many of you know that there's kind of guardrails in there, you know, write me some, you know, um, great malware code or whatever isn't something that, you know, ChatGPT, GPT will do normally, um, and if you said, hey, you know, write me a good, you know, phishing, whether it's a broad scope phishing email or a very spear phishing types of email, you know, it's got some guardrails, but one of my marketing guys was a little um, clever with the prompt that they used. You know, we, we were worried about our CTO, you know, being fish. Can you help us with some example emails so we can train them? And it, uh, it did a really nice job. Um, no spelling mistakes, no grammar errors, and uh, Jason Casey is our, our, our CTO. Um, he happens to be involved with some of the uh, DC think tanks, cybersecurity think tanks and stuff, and he got a, you know, a really nice letter prepared for him using, by the way, the, the ingest part of that was using his LinkedIn profile, so he just gra grabbed all that stuff, and it was you know, one of the think tanks saying, hey, we'd like you to come present, you know, link. He, I, we showed it to him, he's like, yeah, shit, I'd have clicked on that, and he's, again, he's another 25-year, 30-year cyber guy that worked at you know, some of the three-letter agencies, so he's like, yeah, that, would, that one would have probably got me. 
So, you know, now we, we don't even have the telltale, you know, signs, you know, anymore. It's, uh, there's no Nigerian prince who can't spell, you know, trying to get, you know, get my stuff anymore, right? We build up, um, you know, a library of, of different MFA exploits a little bit in the beginning because we had to, you know, had to shake people and say, hey, wait a minute, guys, you know, it's worse than you think and easier to do. So I'm, I'm going to pick, you know, apologies ish to the, so any, any of the Microsoft folks in the audience, but we're going to pick on them a little bit. I'll show you an actual exploit uh, running in action, but this could be like any of the traditional ones. So all the ones that give you a code can be easily social engineered. Anything that's push notification can do the prompt bombing types of attacks. But you know, even if we've you know covered up for that, so I'm going to take you through an attack that was a you know it's using Microsoft's um, passwordless and you know their more modern you know their their new number match stuff that they're actually enforcing that you use now. They they understood that the the existing uh, push notification things that they were using just was not getting it done. So they actually default now to having number match on. So we'll, if this goes a little bit quick, I'll, I can get you copies of the presentation. We can slow it down because I don't think I can with this, but we can look along. So we've got, and, and by the way, this is usually the, using the evil jinx tool. So this is the attack. There's a proxy. This is a classic man in the middle attack. Um, so the, I'm trying to get you know the the bad guys you know asking me to get to a legitimate server and to set up a proxy to be able to grab grab things in the middle. So I'm doing my work. I get my, you know, a serious looking email that I probably should click on and just go to log in. You know, nothing really out of the ordinary. This could come from like anybody in the organization. I log in, you know, on Microsoft, I got the number match here. I complete the number match. And uh, as, a, as the employee, now I'm in, you know, or I'll be into my, into my resources. And, you know, didn't see anything wrong. Bad guy goes back and grabs, you know, the, the information they took. What, what, what they ended up stealing in this way is the session token. I didn't need any of the credentials to log in. I just steal the session token, insert it into the browser, and now I'm logged in. Trivial. Now, it, it didn't used to be trivial. Again, the degree of difficulty was, was pretty hefty you know, for a while. But now it's trivial for folks to pull off these attacks. So we've got to do something different. Can we take, you know, we still want to you know, defense in depth and take the probability that I'm going to click on a link down. But now we've got to make the act of clicking on that link, and particularly if it's an identity-oriented threat, um, not work. And so what CISA's, you know, said is you need to do something called fish resistant MFA. And the way we like to explain is like take the human element out of it. You know, for years, whether it's passwords and password resets and longer, stronger passwords and things like that, we put the burden on our end users to do stuff. So in this case, you know, in a traditional MFA case, you know, the browser can verify that I'm talking to a legit service, right? We just talked about, you know, DigiCert and all the certs that, you know, let, let you know that I'm, if I go to shoes.com and I'm actually, you know, they've got a valid, you know, certificate uh, to shoes.com. So at least it's a, you know, a server that, uh, you know, has been validated. But we asked the human to validate the domain. Pretty easy to fake a domain, you know, one character off and a longer domain name or, you know, some, you know, pre-characters and things like it's, it, or Cyrillic characters that, you know, an L looks like an, uh, an I and, and that sort of thing. So then I also, then the, the human, you know, executes the auth protocol, which is, you know, multiple different, if it's, you know, a password and a second factor, you know, with this, we talked about the social engineering place, I can tack it, but what I can do is I can just grab those credentials as they flow across the network. I don't have to wait. You know, I don't have to decrypt them. I just grab them when they're still in the clear, or I get malware on the machine and and you know grab them when they're getting typed in. So what do we need to do? What what makes something fish resistant? Well, the, there's really two pieces of the equation. The first is that we we use um, strong factors that that don't traverse the network. So I'll give you some examples. So the built-in biometrics that we use, you know, face uh, or fingerprint, you know, kinds of things in modern devices. And, most modern devices have that capability. Those are credentials that, that don't move. They, they stay in the device. You know, Apple, when they brought out the iPhone 4 in their infinite wisdom, decided that they weren't going to store you know, our fingerprints up in their servers, which was a good idea uh, at the time. And so there's TPM hardware uh, on, uh, or an enclave in Apple land. There's specialized hardware on modern devices from phones to laptops to computers that can store that, you know, that keying information, that, you know, the private keys or the biometrics. So the other one is, let's use you know, we can use the same thing that we use to check a, a, a website and validate the website and then set up an encrypted tunnel, an HTTPS or TLS tunnel. We can use that same public-private key. And for those of you guys who have been following along in Identity Land, we've actually got good standards for that. The FIDO teams have pulled together uh, the Fast Identity Online standard for cryptographic pass keys. So that's strong factors on one side. But you, you also have to make sure that it can't be man in the middle. So, and this, let's, let's let the machine do the work. So you got a platform authenticator, something that runs on the machine. 
that can verify the certificate for the user. We can verify the challenge, and this is the big piece. Is the challenge, is the authentication challenge coming from a valid source? And not like HTTPS to keys, is, is can I prove as a second level app to app that the app that is requesting the validation is actually who it says it is? And that's another you know, PKI, public private key trend. And if you can do that, then the, the effect of a, you know, a man in the middle, the effect of the click goes away. It doesn't mean that they, your users won't click on the link, but it's just not going to do anything for them. And that's what NIST calls verifier impersonation protection. So when you start to evaluate MFA solutions now, it has to have that element. If it doesn't, it's barely a speed bump for the bad guys. So this idea of zero trust authentication has a couple things, and, it's, and if you've been following along with the, the CISA, their, um, uh, you know, the, the recent documentation that they put out on their roadmap, uh, for zero trust, the first two pillars in there are identity. You know, you guys are right, it's, they're attacking the identity. So you've got to be able to, you know, close that down. And so in, you know, in, in a zero trust context, that's credentials that don't move. We're, you know, we shouldn't be moving them around. And in fact, credentials that the end users don't know, that can possess it like a, you know, your fingerprint or biometric, but make sure they're not moving across the network. And then the other one is this verifier impersonation. If you've got those, you've got the really good makings uh, to start with. The second piece is the device. You know, if I can, if the, if the result of the click is that I'm trying to steal a session token, but I'm trying to download uh, some malware onto the machine so I can, you know, I can do nefarious things on the machine, that's why the second column in CISA's zero trust architecture is device, making sure that you can actually check the device. And in that, that's, nobody can say, no, no vendor here and no vendor in the community can say, this device is, is secure. What you can say is, are the controls that we expect to have in place for this device there and present during the authentication transaction and then, and then thereafter, don't stop. You know, it's a, the continuous element uh, of that is really important. And that's why if you look at what CISA calls optimal in those first two columns, it's not just that you do you know, phishing resistant you know, MFA and you check device trust, but you do it on a continuous loop. So that's all the elements tied together. Um, I will run you know, how this might look to finish up uh, an access request and our care you know, goes to a single sign on. We use an OIDC to delegate that transaction. We do a public-private key exchange to and, and make the you know, end user you know, show their biometrics. So we've got two strong factors: grab the device security posture and run it, you know, bring it back to our policy engine. A lot of organizations have made hefty investments in a lot of other tech. So why don't we grab risk signals from those things as well? Um, you know, go to your MDM, go to your EDR, and you know, make sure everything looks copacetic on the endpoint before you do it. And then, not, and then when you've, everything's checked out the identity and the device security, then we let somebody in. And then the idea is continuously check that. And if something bad goes wrong, then the ideal would be be able to, to stop it. In our case, we can talk out, you know, talk to a, you know, one of the EDR things and quarantine the device, or we can you know, talk out to a, a ZTNA uh, thing and, and, you know, and drop the network connection. Don't let the bad guy or the potential bad guy you know, get a head start on stuff. So in a nutshell, that's zero trust in action. Oh, and then write out the logs. And that's it for today. So um, I believe uh, is uh, on your way out to, to lunch, uh, wherever you're going, I think somebody's got a pile of our, our books. But if you, you want to do that and, and get a little bit deeper read on what zero trust authentication and all the elements of that looks like, yeah, we've got that as well. You can grab the QR code. Thanks for having me.